Hello, everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the LinkedIn Speaker Series. My name is Meg Garlinghouse, and I lead the social impact work here at LinkedIn, and I have the honor of hosting today's event. So the LinkedIn Speaker Series is all about bringing inspiring ideas and innovative thinkers to help all of us think differently about the world we live in and the work we do in the idea that it can all make us better. So you can find out more information about past speakers at speakers.linkedin.com. But today we are in for a real treat. I'm here to welcome Kelly Corrigan. Kelly, in addition to being one of my closest and dearest friends who I met 25 years ago, when she, and she, by the way, has helped me through heartache and also inspired me to make the biggest life decision I've ever made, which is having a daughter on my own. But in addition to all those things, she's also a New York Times bestselling author, a regular contributor to O Magazine and on the Today Show. And I think she's got some exciting news about some upcoming pieces she's doing on PBS. So Kelly, welcome to the LinkedIn Speaker Series. Hey, nice to be here. I love LinkedIn. Oh, good. We're, we're glad to have you. So Kelly, yeah. um, we have a tradition here at LinkedIn that we okay. ask our speakers what's not on their LinkedIn profile. And by the way, your profile is really good. I checked it out this morning. But what's something that's <laughs> not on your LinkedIn profile? There's, there's, there's three things. One is that I can beat my husband in ping pong. Two is that uh, I'm launching this new show. It's like a prime time one hour interview show on PBS tonight with Brian Stevenson. And then tomorrow I'm launching a podcast called Kelly Corrigan Wonders. So I think that I have properly and officially updated my LinkedIn profile to reflect that. I hope I have. That That's amazing. Um, and by the way, Brian Stevenson was, we hosted him here at LinkedIn about a month ago. Um, and it was yeah. one of the most phenomenal conversations that I've listened to for a long time. So I will definitely be tuning in tonight on PBS to watch that. Like I feel like, and maybe you agree that he's like the Martin Luther King of our times. Like I think he is so deep in the work. And I think for a guy who was played by Michael B. Jordan in a movie and wrote a book that's been on the bestseller list for five or 10 years, he could really check out and just run around the world being Brian Stevenson and having people shower him with accolades well-deserved, but still, there are 150 guys on death row who have his cell phone number, 150 guys who are counting on his visits. And he has never retreated from that hard work. So it was, I think he's astonishing. So I agree with everybody at LinkedIn who's nuts about him after your last yeah. speaker series. Yeah, yeah. And to that point, he literally is one of the many extraordinary things about him is he's flying both at 30,000 feet and on the ground to, to yeah. your, your point on. Um, by the way, I just texted with Edward and he disagrees. You are not the best <laughs> player. Anyway, that's just coming in right now. Um, but anyway, so back to the conversation, because I do want to get to your book, um, which I reread this weekend. Um, and every oh. time I read it, I get another nugget. It's really just such a wonderful read who, for those of you who've not gotten your hands on it, strongly recommend. Um, but one of my first questions for you is um, what motivated, what inspired you to write this book? You know, Edward and I, my husband and I were having this conversation at the dinner table about the difference between saying I'm sorry and I was wrong. And it was my contention that there's something, there's a humility that's baked into I was wrong that we just can't capture with I'm sorry, because as anyone who is raising children knows, like by the time a kid's like three or four years old, they've said I'm sorry so many times and so insincerely that it almost ceases to have meaning before they hit yeah. kindergarten. And, and then also some people say it, you know, in ways that are really undercutting, like I'm sorry you feel that way, or I'm sorry your feelings were hurt. Um, but there's something reuniting if you will, about saying I was wrong. Because what when you say I was wrong, what you're saying is I agree with your worldview. This behavior is indeed wrong. So you and I actually are totally aligned in our view of how this went down and how it should have gone down. And when I say I was wrong, I'm saying I agree with you. I'm on your side again. And that to me and my experience with marital spats and with my kids, 
And even with work things is nothing ends the tension faster than when one party has the guts and it is gutsy to say unequivocally, I was wrong. So that but, but got why? us thinking. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, that got us thinking yeah. about what other things do you need to be able to say to be in adult relationships, like lifetime relationships. And I started keeping this running list of like, you know, I, I would hear a story at a cocktail party or on a walk with one of my friends. And I would say, and, and what was the turning point? And the person would say, you know, I finally just said onward, onward. And I thought, oh, that's one of them. That's, that's a thing you need to be able to say as an adult in the world. And then someone else would say, I finally just said no. And I thought, oh, that's, that's something you need to be able to say as an adult. Uh, and then many people said, I, I am learning to say, tell me more, which is to say, I'm learning to listen. Yeah, you know, back to, um, I was wrong. I mean, yeah, sure. that's such a phrase that I think is so hard for people to say. It, it almost feels unacceptable, particularly in the working world, but also in the political world. Why do you think it is so hard for people to say that? I think the assumption, I think that we are guessing wrong about what's gonna happen next. So I think when you say I was wrong, you think the other person's gonna have the upper hand and you're gonna be smaller and less than. And actually I find it's so startling to people because it's so rare that you actually grow in people's esteem thanks to your ability to just own it, to say there's a mistake. The other outcome of saying it is that you free other people to say it. So anybody who's working on a team to the extent that you can cop to it when you make a mistake, which is a part of daily life, you're freeing up the next person to cop to it. And you can just move so much faster through any project or any conversation or any conflict if people have the nerve to just own it when they blow it yeah. and, and to believe that you can move on from there and keep your status that it won't just crush your status. And it won't. Yeah, it, it gives everyone the freedom to also follow suit and it takes the tension out. If you're like, I was wrong, I was wrong. There's like, you can't actually disagree anymore. Right, Yeah, it's over, um, it's, a, it's a it's tender. A, um, all right, so that brings me to another one of my favorite chapters, which is I don't know. And in this world of incredible uncertainty that we're in right now, and there's so much that we all don't know, um, why is it that humans have such a hard time with this uncertainty and, and being you know, willing, just like I was wrong, to admit that I don't know? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's like really deep reptilian brain fight or flight stuff that's driving mm -hmm. us toward a position of conviction. And I think that conviction is kind of a sugar high. Like I feel like, I mean, I personally have like conviction addiction. Like I don't really love to learn from my 17 year old, let's say, um, all these like mitigating circumstances that might add nuance to what I'm enjoying feeling about a certain person or a certain situation. So it's not like I find that conviction is so alluring because it's super energizing. Like it's like a shot in the arm. Like I'm sure that the, the adrenaline rates are higher when you're in a position of conviction. You feel like you look better, but really probably you look more like a boob. Like I, I've said to Edward, like nothing is sexier in the world to me than when he says, I don't know, you know, actually, I don't know about that. I think, oh my God, you're such like a man's man. That is the manliest thing that you have said all week. Because the fear, I, I feel like there's this driving fear that you're you're never allowed to, to not know or to not be sure of something, but that any thinking person would agree that it's absolutely impossible to know all the time, to be in this constant state of conviction about any given thing, large or small. But it is what our sort of, we were evolved toward. I think we were evolved 
toward rapid cognition, where we could decide instantly whether the thing in front of us was a threat or a potential partner or collaborator. And that we've outgrown that need. I mean, we, we don't, there are no tigers in my kitchen when I'm arguing with Edward. And nonetheless, my old brain like wants to get there, wants to get to this position too quickly. But man, is it just a glorious thing. And more and more every day, especially in the middle of a presidential election. And this book I was writing during the last presidential election, and you just watch these politicians at every level, you know, Congress and in and, and the White House, answering every question as if they're just dead sure that that policy or that move or that tax cut or that tax hike is going to be the answer or this this um, change to education or to the unions or to the environment or to fracking. It, it's abnormal for us to expect that these people have ironclad ideas around every single policy question in front of them. And I think it would do us so well as a society to become more tolerant and even celebratory of people who can say, I don't know, right this second. Of course, if I were president, I would have tons of briefings. So that would give me gobs more information. Here's how I would go about getting to a position. Here's how I make decisions in my life. I read the briefing, I collect expert opinions, I look at history, I look at comps from other nations, whatever it is, however you make a decision, that's what we should be wanting to know about our elected officials, not exactly what you would do in this hypothetical or that hypothetical, because that's just not, it's childish of us to ask that question. That's because it, the fact is that the more information you have, the more your opinion should change. Yeah. So, I mean, I think I don't know as a concept is so important. And I think that it points us toward um, valuing honesty over conviction. Yeah, well, that actually um, makes me wonder about something else that you write about in the book, which is um, being okay to change your mind. I think the bedfellow to I don't know is, is like being okay when you change your mind um, mm -hmm. at work or, you know, back to the, the, the political world. Um, cause it feels like there's a sense of changing your mind. Some, you know, to your point means you don't have conviction or you're confused or, and it's not the opposite, which, oh my God, that person listened to me and now they have a different perspective and they have a more evolved point of view. So mm -hmm. tell me more about, <laughs> about how you get to, so how, how you get someone to change their mind. Well, I have this funny sort of thought experiment going right now where when I'm when I'm in conversation with people, I think I wonder if anything that the two of us have just said to each other has been changed by the thing that was said previously. In other words, like are we affecting each other and is the conversation live or is it like I'm hitting you with my sound bite and then you're hitting me with your sound bite because you know, like as a married person who moves in the world with another person, I know when Edward, let's say, is like rolling out his greatest hits and he knows when I'm doing it. He knows when I'm saying something that I've said a bunch of times before. And you realize like, well, if we're doing it, then probably everybody's doing it, which means that nobody is actually in the room listening so much so that they're being changed that the next thing they're going to say is going to be different now, that they might say something they haven't said before. I mean, that's like a magical moment in a conversation or a friendship or a negotiation or a debate is when you feel like this is the authenticity that everybody's always craving, which is, have you? would you ever say something to me that you haven't said before because the thought is so new to you? But that the other thing that's involved here is this crazy desire for consistency to like make sense, to have like a linear narrative and like switching positions as just as a regular citizen, much less a politician or a CEO or a manager, like changing positions is deeply unsettling for people. As a parent, it's deeply unsettling, right? Your kids you don't say like your your curfew's 10 and then you switch it to 930. Like no way, no how. You once you say the rule, the rule's the rule, and the kids will just murder you if you say, 
It's only a half an hour of screen time, not an hour. And it's the same with the citizenry. Like we just go crazy when politicians change their mind. And it's like, God help us if they didn't change their mind. What would it mean if Joe Biden or Donald Trump had an opinion 30 years ago and given all their life experience and everything they've read and been exposed to that that opinion didn't evolve? That would be tragic. I mean, we, we should consider that a terrible loss, you know? I, I do know, and I, I absolutely agree. Um, well, I would love to to switch to tell me more. And one thought I yeah. had over the weekend as I was rereading this is um, whether you intentionally sequence the chapters. Like, do, do are there certain phrases you have to really nail and embody as a mindset to be able to really fully show up? And so, one one specific example is: Do you really have to ha to be in a, an, an I don't know mindset? to really, really show up with a tell me more mindset or yeah, because of, or are you just telling me more just to kind of, I don't know, just to make the person think they're being listened to. Well, it's so funny because sense? yes, totally. So I'm the mother of two teenage girls. And as, as anybody out there who's raising children will tell you that kind of problems get significantly more complex over time. And our, um, both our ability and our responsibility to solve those problems decreases over time. Like we should be less involved. In which case, tell me more becomes more and more and more important. And it's the same is true on a work team. Like if you have hired the right people, you should not be telling them what to do. You should be asking them what they wanna do. You should be saying, tell me more, tell me more. What else, go on. Like this is how you get answers. And this is how you get the thing behind the thing behind the thing, right? So I think actually that you can sort of fake it to make it with tell me more and still get the benefit because one thing that all people have dealt with complex situations and complex relationships will know is that it's often like the presenting issue is not actually the real issue. Like it's, it's not as described, there's something behind that. And you can either choose to jump in, like buzz in and try to solve the superficial problem that comes up first, or you could say, tell me more, what else go on? And you could see what else is behind it. And as you're discovering that, the I don't know piece just kicks in because you bump right into it. You're like, oh my God, I totally thought that he was furious because X. And then I said, tell me more, what else go on? And then I got to, oh my God, you're mad at your dad? I didn't know you were, I didn't know you you guys didn't talk today. Or, you know, you're talking to your kids and you think, oh, they're mad because they didn't get invited to some party. And then it's like, no, they're mad because this person in their math class said called said they were a cheater and they're not a cheater. And it was like three questions in, you find that out. And so it can be revealed to you through Tell Me More that you should be more humble and you should be. Uh, coming into the world with an I don't know mindset and like more curiosity, less judgment, um, just by sort of faking your way through some of these, the, the tops of these conversations. And then once you hit the new information, then you kind of do feel like the, the humility that's baked into I don't know. Yeah. Um, for those of you who haven't read the book yet, there's a wonderful passage that Kelly retells of a conversation she's having with her, I think maybe then eighth grade daughter, where she goes through this tell me more sequence, um, which is I've actually now tried on my 11 year old daughter and it works. So um, another plug to read that passage. So Kelly, I was thinking about tell me more um, in the context of the recent presidential debates. And I had this mm. fantasy last night. Is, <laughs> yeah. What if the vice president in the pre present had read and brought a tell me more mindset in advance of that? Yeah conversation on Tuesday. And then, and then I just started thinking about, you know, how counter a tell me more mindset is to debate. So, so have yeah. you thought about like how, is it even possible or is that just so absurd to bring a tell me more mindset to the stage of the well, next actually, presidential debate? I think even in a contentious um, competitive scenario, like a debate, um, you would still benefit from tell me more because either you're um, 
your sparring partner would hang themselves in in the description of more and more and more, right? Because it's really easy to give a zippy headline. It's harder to defend your choices and policy positions at a deeper level. So it, they may end up revealing that they they don't have real depth of thought or understanding around something, or they would reveal that they do have some purpose to this position that you weren't aware of, in which case you can actually address the deeper thing. So in an unhealthy way, like I actually think you could win a debate by tell me mooring people. And in the healthiest scenario, you would actually be curious. You would actually want to know, why do you feel that way? Tell me more. Here's a really interesting thing that, that, that kind of goes to this point. In our school in California, a kid was expelled because he put something anti-Semitic on his Instagram feed. And one of my favorite friends is Jewish and she's a therapist and she's so wise. And I was walking with her the next day and I said, what did you think about that kid getting expelled? And I thought that she would be glad. I thought she would be glad that it was like a zero tolerance policy. And she said, I thought it was a huge missed opportunity. I thought we should have gone to him and say, tell me more. Where did you get that language? Where did you get those ideas? What do you know about being Jewish? Have you ever been to a bat mitzvah? Um, what do those words mean to you? Where are you reading that? And really, instead of canceling him effectively, right? He giving him a chance to learn in front of everybody in the hopes that there were other people that have some of those wrongheaded ideas that are now watching this and thinking, oh, I shouldn't be looking at that website either, or I shouldn't be listening to that source either, or I guess I had the wrong information about X, Y, or Z. So I think there's this idea about um, canceling people that is totally antithetical to progress. Yeah, I mean, the cancel culture, I think, is really troublesome. It makes me think that part of the tell me more mindset is both seeking to understand, but on the flip side, how it's received by the other person, it's seeking to be understood. And again, one of your passages, when I think it was your daughter's response, when you finally get, you finally peel back all those layers of the onion, and you finally get to the thing behind the thing behind the thing. And she says, exactly. And it was this beautiful moment where suddenly she felt heard by you and understood by you. And I was thinking about that also in the context of how in this world that feels so divisive and people are coming from such polarized points of view, like how can we get to exactly, or is, is that possible mm -hmm. when people come mm -hmm. from such a different point of view? I mean, we just have to believe that there are things we don't know that would change how we think and feel. You have to have that fundamental assumption that there's things you do not know, and therefore you cannot make a conclusion yet. That's the real power, is that kind of humility that um, fuels curiosity, because curiosity is the answer. Like being deeply curious about how another person's experiencing the world is where all the answers are. Not only is it where the answers are from like a policy perspective and a, and a progress for our troubled nation perspective. But it's also love, like nobody on earth feels more loved than the person who has been thoroughly listened to. Nobody. Be and it's so rare, even like within families where you love these people so much, it is so unusual to actually stop everything, put down your damn phone and zero into somebody and like let them clean out their emotional garage with tell me more, go on, what else? Like it is glorious. It is, it is, it is like love in motion. If you wanna make a kid feel good, if you, wanna, if you wanna love somebody, let them be heard. Let them say it all. If you care about somebody on your team, let them say it all. Ask better questions. It's so easy, it's so easy. Yeah, I, I agree. And it's making me reflect on this extraordinary situation that we are all in right now. And um, one of your chapters towards the end, which is This Is It, when you kind of weirdly um, reflect on why this all matters. And I think so many of us are, are wondering to ourselves, 
why this all matters, the situation we are in right now that feels so challenging. And it does seem like it's an opportunity to really double down on the tell me more, bringing everyone back to the center of what matters most. But can you share with us a bit more of what's in that chapter? This is it? Yeah, sure. So um, I'll just do a short reading for you guys so you get the sense of it. Um, and it, it's about transitioning for me from a very um, childish mindset to something that is much smaller in my goals and expectations, but also probably much deeper. When I got out of college, my goal was to become interesting with a capital I. I fancied Mary Oliver poems, the word intrepid, and my motto, things happen when you leave the house. My path was adventure. I saved for two years living on my cousin's couch. Eventually I filled a fanny pack with all the money I had, $3,800 in traveler's checks, which for the average LinkedIn employee, I just wanna explain is like a little piece of paper that has monetary value. A lonely planet guide, the phone number of a guy my dad used to know and some antibiotics my mom made me bring, which is really like everything you need to know about my parents in a phrase. Like my mom was like, you take these antibiotics. My dad was like, lovey go see this guy. He's a great drinker. He'll take you out all night. Um, so anyway, I went off into the world with my college roommate, Tracy Tuttle, and we wanted to be bartenders. That was our big idea. So we were going to go to Australia and be these kind of cool American girls working the bar, giving out free drinks and sort of integrating ourselves into the youth culture. But it turns out that those jobs weren't available to us. And so we became nannies of all things. And Tracy, my roommate, was a nanny for four kids. And I was a nanny for kids who had just lost their mother. And I was the first nanny on the scene. I had a four-year-old and a seven-year-old. And it caused me to rethink what I valued. So I said, I left that house less smitten with world travelers and their ripping yarns and more awed by people who had thrown themselves into what I was starting to see was for me the one gig that mattered, parenthood. And then I talk a little bit about getting lost in the weeds of parenting and a big family fight. And then at the very end, I say, like, here, let me go back one, one paragraph. It's a lonely business, parenting, and then sometimes strangely claustrophobic. This is what I wanted and what my friend Liz, who died young, was pulled away from against her every fiber. This abstract performance art called family life is our one run at the ultimate improv, our chance to be great for someone, to give another person enough of what they need to be happy, ours to overlook or lose track of or bemoan, ours to recommit to, to apologize for, to try again, ours to watch disappear into their next self, toddler to tyke, tween to teen, ours to drop off somewhere and miss forever. It's happening right now, whether we attend to it or not. Like after preparing a nutritious meal that no one really liked and a lot of blame gaming over who forgot to take out the compost, your peevish, greasy young adult tramps off to take the shower she should have taken two days ago and the evening is shot to shit and not one minute of it looked like the thing you prayed for so long ago. But then you hear something. You head up the stairs and hover outside the bathroom door. All the single ladies, all the single ladies. The kid is singing in the shower. Your profoundly ordinary kid is singing in the shower and you get to be here to hear it. It, it, it is what it matters. That is what matters is, is mm -hmm. the everyday moments that we're experiencing. Um, so Kelly, back to your book, which again, seems like weirdly so relevant to the time we're in right now. Um, mm. what, what was a phrase that you thought was going to be kind of the, the killer phrase that was going to drive the book forward outside of tell me more. And what is the phrase that you've found that's resonated most with your readers? Well, I do hear a lot about Tell Me More. I mean, I, I hear from people constantly that they're using it at work and at home and that it's like this go-to thing. It also is buying people a lot of time. So if you don't know the answer or if you feel caught off guard by a problem that someone's bringing you at home or at work, it is kind of nice to buy a minute to take a breath and say, tell me more. 
And then as they go on, like I'm going to say half the time they solve the problem by themselves. So I think that's a huge favorite for some. Um, I struggled mightily with Onward, uh, which is this sort of, I, I had it in my mind as, oh, well, like that that is really something that you need to be able to say as a grown up. Like a lot of shit goes wrong. A lot of stuff doesn't work out. Things break. Relationships, big, huge relationships between husband and wife end. People get fired. They lose their income. Like you have to be able to move on and move forward from things. So I had it as, oh, well, for a while. But then I had one of the people I talked to in, in creating uh, the sort of set of stories for the book had lost a child. And I thought th that person said, oh, definitely. You definitely need to be able to say, oh, well, at some point. Shit, it's going to take you 15 years. But if 15 years later, you're going to have to say, am I going to be here or am I not going to be here? Am I going to be in the world? Because if I'm going to be in the world, I cannot live with that boulder on my back and in my heart 24 hours a day. But I thought, no, that's not the right word anymore. And so I, I came up with Onward. And then I had a completely different chapter written. I had a totally different story written. And then I realized that I had, I had talked a lot in the book about this friend of mine, Liz Lotz, who died of ovarian cancer. It was the first friend of mine to die. And it's a very big moment for everyone. I don't know how many people have gone through it yet on this Zoom, but it's, um, it's, a, it's a life moment to lose a peer, to lose somebody that is your age that you thought you were going to grow old with. And I all of a sudden realized like way after the book was due and, and I had handed in a manuscript that I should just write a letter to Liz for Onward. And I should tell her, I should update her on her kids and her husband and tell them, tell her how they're doing. And that that would be the best way to show people moving forward, not away from her, but sort of with her in a weird way. So that was the hardest chapter to write for sure. And then weirdly the easiest, like I sat down, I wrote the whole letter to her, I sent it to my editor and I never touched it again. Um, were there any other phrases that were in as potential chapters that got thrown out other than onward that got updated? I had 17 at one point uh, oh, wow. and I cut some, but a, a big one that got cut is I had, um, you can go because mm -hmm. I lost my dad and I was alone in the room with him when he died. And I really, really, really loved my dad. Um, and it, the chapter got so big and so long that my editor said, I think it's its own book. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't think that no yeah. one, it will overshadow everything. All people will remember about this book is this beautiful story of the last couple of weeks of your dad's life. So yeah. I took it out and I hope to write it as a full book at some point, but I'm finding it very, very difficult uh, to yeah. finish. Um, Kelly, did you see the piece in the New Yorker about, by Ann Patchett, by her three fathers? I did. Yeah. So I just Big read it this weekend also. It's really beautifully written. And it made yeah, me wonder, um, you know, the role that your dad played in your life um, among those it, kind of the three models or, or just generally individuals who have inspired you because writing a book is a big, a big, big undertaking. And um, I'm sure there were a lot of, a lot of um, voices in your head that were probably saying, some saying, tell me more, some saying no. Um, but So talk to us more about how, who are those individuals in your head that help you persevere yeah. in writing this book or, or anything in life right now? I mean, I was very, very well loved. And that is uh, an unimaginable gift. Like if you look at everything that's wrong in the world, I really think if you look at everything that's wrong in the world, the people who are driving division, the people who are um, living for greed, the people who are filling themselves up with sex, drugs, alcohol, food, 
you know, like the people who are punishing themselves with addiction or suffering from addiction. Um, I think that if a, if you have been well loved there, you got a chance, you always have a chance. And so the, the feeling I have coming out of that childhood with this guy who was just looking at me like this all the time, like lovey, what do you, what do you got now? Like I picture him right now. So this TV show is going to run tonight and this podcast is going to start tomorrow that I'm doing. And I just, I don't even need to talk to him because I can just hear him in my head yeah. saying, lovey, fantastic. God, is this great? You're on the TV, then you're on the podcast thing. I mean, you wouldn't be able to download a podcast, but um, it, it's just such a gift. It's such a gift to have somebody give you the face of love like a consistent source like that is such a gift. And it's, and I find that the job now in his absence is to be that, is to be him, is to give other people the face of love. Well, in many ways, Greeny, which um, is the beloved name of Kelly's father, he was the ultimate tell me more. Like he was the guy was. who was so authentically curious, not, I mean, about you, yes, but really about everybody around him. I, mean, I had the opportunity to spend time with him and I felt like he was just intensely curious about me and what I was doing and all my ideas yeah. and, and positions. Yeah. And he really, he is, he is the manifestation of tell me more. Yes, he is. You know, it's funny. I wrote this kid's book. It comes out in April. It's called Hello World, which is what my dad used to say every morning. And um, the idea is that what I wanted to call it was, oh, the people you will know as kind of a riff on, oh, the places you will yeah. go, which is such yeah. an incredibly popular book for moments of transition. And in my strong opinion, it's not the places you will go. It's the people you will know that will make your life rich and whole. And I watched it. I watched him make a world right in front of my eyes of um, goodness and connection. And he just did it wherever he went. I mean, he could, he could get the guy at the gas station going. He could talk to the guy after mass on the front steps of the cathedral. He could talk to the person who let him in the door at Hearst up in New York City every day. Talk to the guy sitting next to him on the subway. Like the, to him, it was like everybody was just fascinating. And I think that's really true. I think if you know how to ask questions or say, tell me more, everybody is fascinating. And that's really the heart of the PBS show and the podcast that Kelly Corgan wonders is that I really do find everybody so goddamn interesting. And I want to talk to them. And I remember like being on the Today Show with my dad 16 years ago. And after we finished, and it was so fun, and Katie Couric interviewed us, which is like a total throwback. And um, I remember saying to him, like, you know whose job I want? I want Terry Gross's job. I want Charlie Rose's job. And I feel like tonight I'm getting Charlie Rose's job and tomorrow I'm getting Terry Gross's job. Like I'm really getting to do the very thing that I enjoy doing the most, cameras and microphones or not, which is just talking to people and finding out what makes them tick, what worries them to death, um, what thrills them. Um, so actually, really quickly, we heard a bit about what you're doing tonight on PBS, but can you tell us more about the podcast that launches tomorrow? Is it just like your regular yeah, so old podcast or what makes it different? It's um, it's cool. It's We ask one question every month and then we stick with the question for four weekly episodes. So it's called Kelly Corrigan Wonders. It's on PRX, but you'll just get it wherever you get your podcast. And so the first question for October is what conventional wisdom is kind of bullshit. I mean, that's not how we phrase it for the general public, but between us, that's the gist of the question. And so I went to these four writers, podcaster people that I'm friends with, and I asked them like, what platitude or maxim just drives you bananas? And then let's talk about it. So uh, one woman said, uh, trust your gut. Like she thinks is really dangerous idea for us all to believe in because it doesn't honor confirmation bias and how limited our own life experiences are, which is indeed the thing that's shaping our gut. And then we did um, never give up. Everything happens for a reason. And what you don't know can't hurt you. And so, and then the second series, which is in November, is 
basically the question is what superpowers does every one of us have, whether we recognize it or not, that we could be using to move society forward. So one is we can always find common ground with anybody, even people we think we hate. Um, there's always some modicum of agency available to us. There's, um, we always have the option to forgive and that people do in the extraordinary circumstance, circumstances. There are models for us out there and that we can always grow our self-awareness. So self-awareness is this incredible feature that we could develop that could be change, life-changing and society-changing. So, and then we go from there to how change happens and we do that for a month. So anyway, it's really cool. And I think it's like, um, I don't know, I think of it as people who like to laugh while they think, like that's the audience for Kelly Corgan Wonders. And um, the episodes are like 30 to 40 minutes and they're kind of fast, smart, funny, and human. That that sounds uh, worth, worth tuning into for sure. Um, so Kelly, I can't believe we're actually at the end of our speaker series. I wanted to, to end it, bring it back to Greeny. And what, what would Greeny say um, to all of us to survive what we're all in it together right now? What, 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 what would he, what, if you, you were to call him up right now, what advice would be he be reflecting on giving to you and to all of us? Um, you got to give people survive. a chance, love you. You got to give people a chance. You know, he, he, he would worry that we're all getting hard. He wouldn't want us to be hard in the world. He would want us to be porous. He would want us to take things in. He would want us to consider more about a person. Like don't, don't write people off, you know, don't, don't, don't dismiss anybody, like give them a chance. He really believed in people. He believed that, that, that the great things could happen in all sorts of places and in all sorts of circumstances and that that greatness was born of people believing in one another. Well, uh, what a wonderful note to, to, to leave this conversation with. And I absolutely believe him in that regard as well. And, and your whole reflection from Kelly, Kelly Corgan wonders that um, we all can find common ground if we try mm -hmm. hard enough. And, Tell me more is is a pathway to getting there that we can all use, and we need more common ground more than ever right now. So Kelly, thank you so much for for joining us today. Um, we're so glad, and um, if everyone can can join it with a virtual round of applause. Bye. And bye, Kelly, and thank you everyone for tuning in. And we hope to see you next time um, in our next speaker series. Thanks so much.